G'day YouTube, Warbles on a lot here, rainy Sunday morning. Let's have a little look at uh, pollution on the seas. Now the search out there in the wild wastes of the southern Indian Ocean continues, but it seems every new lead well, turns out to be little more than floating junk, discarded fishing equipment, general rubbish, which might make you wonder how much garbage and debris is floating out there at sea. What is it? Where does it come from? What's it doing to marine life and ecosystems? Well, in 2011, the CSIRO partnered with Earthwatch. It was a three-year project they embarked on, a, a project to, to survey the Australian coastline and surrounding oceans, a comprehensive survey of marine debris. It's going to deliver its final report later this year. Uh, Dr Denise Hardesty is from CSIRO. She's leading that research team and joins us now. Denise, welcome. Thank you. Good to be here. Now, if the sort of junk that we're seeing in the search for the airline, as Andy indicated, this is a big problem. There must be a lot of this stuff in the oceans. Can, can you give us a sense of that scale? It really is a big issue, and I think one of the things that most of us consider is that the oceans are these beautiful, blue, deep water, clean, pristine environments. But unfortunately, when we look a little bit closer, we realize that's simply not the case. So we've done surveys around the coastline, as you just mentioned, and we've also circumnavigated the continent aboard ships of opportunity, where we've gone out and actually run basically really tiny little nets, about a meter wide through 30 centimeters, and just sort of run those nets every 80 or 100 nautical miles across that very tippity top surface layer of the waters and mm. what we find in doing that is that there are estimates of literally thousands to tens of thousands of little bits of rubbish every square kilometer in our oceans and a lot of this is uh, to do with plastic is it not in the way in which mm. the plastic breaks down under the influence of sun and sea it becomes smaller and smaller and smaller Absolutely. So I was saying, you know, the nets are pretty small, actually. That's a meter by 30 centimeters. So we don't get big bits. In mm. fact, almost everything that we find in our nets is pretty small, like smaller than five millimeters. So these are the things that have broken down from all of our everyday use products, from toothbrushes and bottles and drink caps and um, all sorts of random items that we use every day. And we only see those things that tend to float, those things that are up at the surface. So that's what we end up trapping in those nets when we run them. And this, this is it a layer in the oceans of, of these small plastic pieces? Is it, is it, does it go to a particular depth or is it, is it through the water to considerable depth? Well, so that, that's a really good question and there are some folks that are doing work to look at what they call the vertical stratification, which means how much in the top layer, in that top, you know, a couple of centimeters to the top meter to 10 meters and 20 meters and 40 meters. And there's also folks trying to look at the, the ocean floor to see how much of our rubbish mm. is actually sinking there. But what we're going to find in the top bits is mostly going to be plastic, right? Because plastic is what floats. And different types of plastics have different amounts or levels of buoyancy, so they can float in different sort of areas of the water. So if you think about like a plastic bag out there in the water, you know, it doesn't necessarily float on the top, but it'll just kind of drift along just below the surface of the water. Like a jellyfish. I mean, we're all used, exactly. to, we're used to this idea of, of shipping containers and, and big lumps mm. of stuff floating around. But this is a this is an in, this is barely perceptible, I suppose, which is the point of your study. Yeah, and you know, really, if most of what we're finding are these little itty bits that are often called microplastics, um, you know, what does that tell us when we start to see these really big objects? So, where are those coming from? Where are they moving to? And, you know, the big question on everybody's mind is, are we finding any bits or pieces that are associated with this, this missing aircraft? For sure. Uh, there was a, a, a memorable sentence in a, in a story I read on this this week which talks about the oceans as being like a, a toilet that swirls but never flushes, mm. which, which is evocative, I think. <laughs> and, and I it guess is. that's the problem, isn't it? There's nowhere for this material to go. It doesn't... You know, people talk about, well, it just goes away. Well, where is this mythical away? 
you know it plastic doesn't break down except it breaks down into smaller and smaller and smaller bits which really means that then it's accessible to smaller and smaller organisms out there in the ocean and it, you know we actually not me personally but other researchers have actually found plastic in plankton in really really small tiny ocean organisms so we find that plastic is being taken up by organisms as small as plankton and as larger humongous as whales you know turtles and dolphins and seabirds all sorts of wildlife it's estimated that more than 600 different species of marine life have been impacted or affected by marine debris and that means they either mistake it for food and they eat it or they get caught up or tangled in it like what happens in the derelict fishing gear and fishing nets and lines and things like that that are out there floating in our oceans as well and that that effect is is i guess clear and, and we can imagine what that does to the animals that get caught up externally like that mm. but with the ingestion of plastic is that uh, a benign thing or does that cause injury to the the wildlife that take it in so you know again that's a really good question and some people will say well plastic is killing our seabirds and sometimes it does and it certainly can but understanding that sort of sublethal effect so if a bird has one or two pieces of plastic in it how much does that matter you know i've carried out studies of birds that have died and have found up to a couple hundred of a couple hundred pieces of plastic in a single individual and in that I found everything from a glow stick that you use in fishing to three or four rubber balloons to string and line a doll's arm ties and bits that um, come off of helium balloons all sorts of things as well as bottle caps and other bits of unidentified plastic and some of those objects can be really sharp and so they can actually puncture or perforate the belly of a bird and when you think about how much it is for the volume it means that the birds then or you know turtles or mm. other animals that have ingested it they just they just can't get the food and the nourishment that they need to make their way you know these wildlife they're not like us. They're not sitting on couches in the living room having a really comfy time. They're out there earning their existence every day of their lives, right on the edge. Dr. Denise Hardesty, she's from the CSIRO, an expert in marine debris, and that's been a subject which has, I guess, lobbed into our attention since the search began for flight MH370. Uh, Denise, this is a thing which astounds me and that perhaps you can describe and explain it to us the, the great pacific garbage patch so one of the things that's really interesting is people think about and hear about the pacific garbage patch and it is a tremendous area but it's not this island people talk about oh it's this island and you can walk on it well there's actually five of these large circulating areas where the ocean currents aggregate objects or items and that sort of thing so we actually have five gyres and the area that they've been searching for this missing craft is a bit on the edge of what's you know one of the two main southern ocean gyres so that is an area of accumulating debris okay. so what happens in these areas are these are sort of aggregating areas where the ocean currents and the winds etc prevail so that we get accumulating zones now they're not static right people actually talk about or think about the pacific garbage patch as this big solid set island well it's actually moving tens and hundreds of kilometers in each year with the seasons with the change in weather conditions so these are really dynamic gyres and there are several of them i guess they constantly accumulate i mean as you say there's nowhere for this material to go and if it's accumulating in these places it must continue to grow it does, and it does continue to accumulate. And by way of an example, there's been an estimate that seabirds that breed out on Midway Island, Midway Atoll, which is out in the middle of the Pacific in that great garbage patch, they estimate that those albatross are bringing back up to five tons of plastic rubbish each year. It's quite That's just from... They're quite astounding numbers, aren't they? It is, and I don't think we want our wildlife to be our garbage collectors. This is the small stuff we're talking about, little, the little bits. Shipping t containers, too, mm. many thousands go overboard each year. That, again, is another significant problem, not only because of themselves, but because of the stuff that they spill out as well. Well, we do lose containers each year. I think I 
recently read that there was one vessel that recently, maybe last month or the month before, lost over 500 containers. So that's a tremendous amount of waste of consumer goods that are, you know, really on the way to shops to end up in our homes for our daily use and consumption of various types of products. And that stuff is out there. It's then going to be in large pieces, the way that it started out. And then through time, that stuff will break into smaller and smaller bits and become these unidentifiable little bits, pieces of plastic mm -hmm. that are floating around in our oceans. What? So containers are definitely an issue. But in general, about 80% of the rubbish that we find in the oceans is actually expected to come from land. So, and a lot of those land sources are near our major urban centers, not just within Australia, but around the world. Well, the consequences uh, can be, be quite extraordinary. Dr. Denise Hardesty, she's a CSIRO scientist, been working in the last three years on this extraordinary uh, research project looking at marine debris around the Australian coastline and surrounding oceans. Mm, that's all a bit sad, isn't it? Warbles on a lot to YouTube. Time to go and record the outsiders. Ciao.